think it's extremely important for the American people to know that there can be the overthrow of a government, that there can be a coup d'etat in America, that that in fact did happen through the assassination of President Kennedy in order to prevent that kind of thing from happening again, in order to expose the forces that were responsible for that kind of murder and the kind of cover-up that has ensued in the following 25 years, it's necessary to expose it. Otherwise, we can have the same thing repeated again. Therefore, in the same fashion that we have exposed problems and scandals involved with Watergate, problems in Vietnam, problems in Central America, problems in the overthrow of governments elsewhere like Allende in Chile, and on and on and on, so must we expose that same kind of political assassination in our country. As painful as it may be, as uh, disruptive as it might be in a transitory nature, as embarrassing as it might be to certain individuals and organizations in the United States government, that has to be uncovered. If they were able to do it to John F. Kennedy then, they could do it to some other president in the future. Given the nature of the president's most powerful enemies at that time, and who had the most to gain from the assassination, my feeling is that there are four groups that are suspect. The more militarily uh, oriented of the anti-Castro Cubans, the people who felt betrayed by President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs. Havana in the 1950s was like no other place in the world. Well known as a city of pleasure, it was actually a type of political and criminal free zone, a strange place where mobsters mixed freely with businessmen and politicians, most of them from America. At the center of this creative criminal energy was a former army general named Fulgencio Batista, a mulatto Cuban who took control of the country in 1952 and ran it with help from the mafia and the United States government. Batista fell, his military collapsed, uh, and the Castro forces walked into Havana largely uh, unresisted. Within his first year, Castro had taken over the U.S.-run telephone companies, had forced rate reductions from the electrical companies, had expropriated hundreds of thousands of acres from U.S. sugar and fruit companies, and had nationalized the oil refineries. Most dangerously, he had made a public pact with America's enemy, the Soviet Union, at once alienating the United States and thrusting his country smack in the middle of the Cold War. Soon after the elections, it became necessary to brief President-elect Kennedy on vital security matters. I was then director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And I remember meeting him in the Kennedy home in Palm Beach. For a full year, the Eisenhower administration had been planning an invasion of Cuba, using disenfranchised anti-Castro Cubans as their fighting force. In transferring power to Kennedy, the Eisenhower administration also transferred this secret plan. It became known as the Bay of Pigs. What was done was that Dulles and Bissell planned, eventually planned the landing at the Bay of Pigs so that it would fail if, in fact, Kennedy didn't permit not only air support, but major intervention, major ground forces, U.S. ground forces, to, to become a part of it. And, and they never believed Kennedy wouldn't do that. When Kennedy didn't go along at the height of the crisis, the operation failed. And as a result of that, uh, Kennedy became totally disillusioned with the CIA. The Bay of Pigs was a serious and embarrassing failure for the Kennedy administration. After the Bay of Pigs, he was so annoyed with the CIA that he said that he'd like to rip the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the wind. On October 3rd of 1963, the New York Times reported that the CIA was, quote, a malignancy that the White House could not control. It went on to warn that if the United States ever experiences an attempt at a coup to overthrow the government, it will come from the CIA. 
the agency represents a tremendous power with total unaccountability to anyone, end quote. Kennedy did not dismantle the CIA. He did, however, try to control it and make it his own. He fired the key Eisenhower appointees, such as Director Alan Dulles, Deputy Director and Air Force General Charles P. Cable, and Deputy Director of Plans Richard Bissell. He felt it was an agency out of control. But Kennedy never truly brought the agency under control, and his defeat at the Bay of Pigs made him susceptible to a new and intense criticism. Developments in Red Cuba, 90 miles from the shores of Florida, hold more ominous warnings for a sleeping American public. While the deadly enemies of the American people close in for their final stages of encircling our nation, enemy nations within intensify efforts to chip away the foundations upon which American freedom rests. More and more strange voices call for surrendering of our national sovereignty to some type of world authority. There are increasing efforts to centralize authority in the federal government in Washington, D.C., under the guise of federal aid. Of all the defeats in the Cold War, the capture of Cuba by the communists is the most unacceptable. Kennedy tried to silence these critics by fighting the Cold War on their terms. He authorized a CIA covert action against Cuba, and he put his brother in charge of the operation. It became known as Operation Mongoose. And the only decent thing that came out of the whole mongoose operation, the boys in Miami, where we had our base, uh, were able to recruit some little farmer or a peasant in Pinar del Rio province in the western part of Cuba. And he gave us a report, and all it said was, in an area bounded by four towns, is the only report that mentioned these four towns. And if you plot these four towns on a map and connect them up with a, a thin line, you'll see you get what, they, what became called a trapezoid, a trapezoid area. And that's what targeted the U-2. That's what finally got the U-2 over that particular spot. And the rest, of course, is now history. The U-2 came back with the pictures and uh, we had the evidence we needed. Uh, Kennedy had the evidence he needed. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on the island of Cuba. The Cuban Missile Crisis was what the anti-Castro Cubans had dreamt about. They loved it. I mean, to them, this was the opportunity to finally get rid of Castro. They didn't seem to quite appreciate the fact that in the process they may have blown up the world. Uh, but if Castro could be disposed of, what the hell? The pressures to invade Cuba were persistent and intense. The anti-Castro Cubans wanted to reclaim their land. The radical right wanted to destroy communism. And individuals within the CIA saw this as an opportunity to avenge the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Kennedy refused to invade Cuba and was able to resolve the crisis peacefully. In doing so, Kennedy stood up to Khrushchev, but he also stood up against the radical right and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I have uh, today been informed by Chairman Khrushchev that all of the IL-28 bombers now in Cuba will be withdrawn in 30 days. He also agrees that these planes can be observed and counted as they leave. Inasmuch as this goes a long way towards reducing the danger which faced this hemisphere four weeks ago, I have this afternoon instructed the Secretary of Defense to lift our naval quarantine. But there were moments at the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis when the, some members of the Joint Chiefs had been hoping for an, an order to invade Cuba were very f f were furious uh, that uh, Kennedy had resolved this crisis uh, peacefully. And they felt a great opportunity had been lost to invade Cuba, to chest out new weapons, to get rid of Castro, and so on. The mob, who wanted the gaming rights back in Havana, they were losing millions of dollars every day uh, since Castro closed the casinos. The ultra-right wing, who hated President Kennedy for virtually everything he stood for. And the ultra-right wing hawks within the CIA, the ones who had been fired, or people related to those uh, politically, who had been fired uh, by President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs. They all had a common goal. They wanted 
the president out of the way. They wanted Cuba clear of Castro and the communist threat in the Western Hemisphere. They had the most to gain. They had the motive, the opportunity, and the means to kill President Kennedy. If that is the cake, then the icing on the cake is the president's decision to withdraw the troops from Vietnam. That was the CIA's war. They wanted it, they wanted to promote it, they wanted to push it. The people who I think had most to gain as they saw it were the military industrial intelligence complex. It's a myth that the intelligence agents don't make policy. They make it all the time. They always say they're carrying out policy and sometimes they are. The people who had most to gain were those who didn't want the peace in the world that John Kennedy had tried to turn the world toward when he and Khrushchev worked out the solution to the Cuba Missile Crisis. The people who didn't want John Kennedy to be president were those who were making incredible fortunes from war production. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. After the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved, and it was clear that there would be no invasion of Cuba, a rumor started to circulate among anti-Castro Cubans that Kennedy had made a secret deal with Khrushchev. According to the rumor, Khrushchev removed the missiles in exchange for Kennedy's agreement to end his hostilities with Cuba. The anti-Castro Cubans here couldn't believe it. I mean, to them this was the utmost in traitorous behavior. Some anti-Castro Cubans even thought he was communist, thought he was uh, a mole at the highest level, as it were. I mean, this is the kind of thinking uh, that was going on at the time. And a, a tremendous uh, uh, hatred of Kennedy developed among the anti-Castro Cubans and also among the CIA agents who, in fact, got, had become so associated with the anti-Castro Cubans and training them and even going on raids with them, actually. Uh, uh, their, their sense of betrayal was as strong as that uh, which the anti-Castro Cubans felt. The anti-Castro Cubans were not getting the sympathy or support they once did, and they took out their frustrations at peace demonstrations, which, ironically, often turned violent. One of the most prominent peace groups was a pro-Cuba organization called Fair Play for Cuba. The New Orleans chapter of Fair Play for Cuba was manned by an ex-Marine named Lee Harvey Oswald. He was the only member of the chapter, and he was filmed passing out pro-Cuba literature on the streets. John F. Kennedy emerged from the Cuban Missile Crisis a new man and a new power. Standing up to the radical right and the vestiges of the Eisenhower administration, he was finally able to set his own agenda and enact his own policies and ideas. He took full advantage of the opportunity by calling for a test ban treaty. Both Kennedy and Khrushchev stared into the nuclear abyss and both of them were determined thereafter to move toward detente. And the first action in that was, of course, the American University speech, which followed by the negotiation of the test ban treaty. At American University, he did the unthinkable. He extended a hand of peace to the Soviet Union. Kennedy made a speech at American University in June of the year before he died, and he said, we live in one world, we gotta breathe in the same air, and we gotta live together, we're gonna die together. He was very disturbed by our involvement in Vietnam, which he inherited. And there came a time when he called his generals in and spoke to them, and after he spoke to them, the Pentagon issued a small statement saying that we have re-evaluated our involvement with Vietnam and find that we can begin to withdraw our men. The plan was to with begin by withdrawing a thousand a month. Seventeen thousand were to be withdrawn by the time of the election, which was a year later. One plane load reached the United States when John Kennedy was killed. Three days after the assassination, the body wasn't yet in the ground. The Pentagon issued what it called a re-evaluation of its re-evaluation. And they said simply that we found that our re-evaluation was optimistic. And the rest is history. The whole world turned around on it. Had Kennedy lived, I think we'd have had no Vietnam War with all of its traumatic and divisive influences in America. I think we would have escaped that. I think the world would have escaped it. The 50,000 odd Americans dead and uh, 300,000 more wounded and over half a million more hooked on dangerous drugs and tropical diseases. The divisiveness of that war that 
so many of the people thought unjustified and unnecessary and it shouldn't have been there. It split this country widely and uh, many of those things have lingered on since. Former FBI agent and professional investigator Bill Turner has been researching the JFK assassination since the weekend it happened. His exhaustive probing has given him exceptional insight into the events and reasons surrounding Kennedy's death. There was much anger over his failure to provide air cover at the Bay of Pigs. There was much anger oh, when he did not invade Cuba during the missile crisis in October 1962. After the Bay of Pigs, John Kennedy reamed out uh, the CIA for conducting too high a profile, uh, meaning an invasion. And he said he wanted to continue the campaign against Castro, but he wanted it so it was low profile and invisible. And so the Kennedy brothers did develop a secret agenda. And Bobby was a protagonist in which there would be a series of sabotage raids, uh, there would be continued assassination attempts uh, against Castro, and there would be uh, teams ready to go into Cuba if the time was right to, for a second invasion. I am very convinced that the assassination of John F. Kennedy came from the collaboration between the CIA and the Mafia in attempting to assassinate Fidel Castro. And I feel very strongly that that apparatus that was set up to assassinate Castro simply was turned on Kennedy when the motive piled upon motive to get rid of him. Building on the foundations laid by Bill Turner, using classified documents newly released under the Kennedy Assassination Records Act, the investigation into the Kennedy brothers' secret agenda against Fidel Castro has been greatly extended. Project Freedom is the name given to that agenda by two Atlantan writers and researchers. Over the last seven years, Lamar Walton has built up a formidable database on this secret agenda and its relationship to Kennedy's murder. Together with colleague Tom Hartman, they have gained unique access to individuals closest to these events and have unraveled some of the darkest secrets lying at the heart of the assassination. Project Freedom, again, was, was Bobby Kennedy's project um, that he ran only with his most trusted advisors. So you had Bobby at the top, based in Washington, and also based much of the time in Washington, you had his Cuban confidant. That was Bobby's main liaison with the other small handful of exile leaders that he trusted to work on Project Freedom with him. Those leaders would sometimes contact Bobby directly, but most of the time they would go through as his Cuban confidant. So a second invasion of Cuba was being planned using a force of Cuban exiles. But the character changed when they cooperated or co-opted a, a high official in Havana and the opportunity for an assassination of Castro and a coup presented itself. So this, is, this developed along the line, and uh, at that point, the uh, second invasion became more of a backup type of idea. John Kennedy, in his settlement with uh, Premier Khrushchev, the Soviet Union, you know, the missile crisis in October of 1962, had agreed that there would be no U.S. involvement in any type of adverse actions uh, against Cuba. That was part of the agreement. So this had to be kept from the Soviet Union, it had to be kept from the FBI, it had to be kept uh, from anybody and anybody that didn't have a need to know. One of the reasons the Bay of Pigs had failed was because we didn't have good intelligence that told us what the reaction of the Cuban people really would be when the invasion happened. Well, Bobby Kennedy was determined not to let that happen again. So there was a general effort throughout the summer and fall of 1963 to get people into Cuba by legitimate means, not by secret boats in the middle of the night, as the CIA was capable of doing, but these would be people who would go in legitimately, would be able to walk the streets, talk to people, because this was very important for Project Freedom. Tom and Lamar's detailed study of recently declassified documents has revealed a secret plan, part of Project Freedom, that was hijacked by Kennedy's killers, enabling them to escape detection. Beginning in September of 1963, several agencies of the U.S. government, at Bobby Kennedy's direction, began making contingency plans regarding Project Freedom. 
They were worried about what would happen if Castro found out about the plan and retaliated in some way. And so Bobby was faced with, with a, a serious problem here. He had a plan that had a very good chance of actually unseating Castro. What if Castro found out about it? And what if Castro found out about it before it happened and launched a preemptive attack of some sort against the United States? Not a military attack, but some sort of a, you know, a hit and run thing. What if he were, for example, to assassinate the U.S. ambassador to Panama or to Guatemala or something like this? And so Bobby had his advisors put together a series of contingency plans around this Cuban operation, these Cuban contingency plans uh, by the State Department, the FBI, the CIA, the Defense Department, um, people involved in them like Alexander Haig and, and, and Joseph Califano, uh, who, who put together this program that this is how we're going to respond if Castro does something against us, if he kills one of our people. And we want to very carefully control the, the release of information about the evidence. We want to control the evidence in a way that, that we can prevent inflammatory information from getting out that would cause the press to go nuts, that would cause the, the, the Republicans to use this as a, as a, as a, as a political tool, that would, that would cause Americans to demand an immediate invasion of Cuba that could lead to World War III. They had to have control of the information. There were very low-level operatives and informants working for the CIA whose primary allegiance was to the Mafia. And these people had been working with the Mafia for much longer than they had been working with the CIA. And the Mafia paid them many, many times what the CIA did. Uh, those people not only told the Mafia bosses like Traficante and Marcello about Project Freedom, but they worked with the Mafia in ways to use those plans to kill President Kennedy and use the secrecy surrounding Project Freedom to cover up the Mafia's role in it. The forces involved, I'm firmly convinced, were the same ones that were involved in the ongoing attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. And I'm talking about the combination or the alliance between the CIA and the Mafia to snuff Castro. And I think that what happened at Dallas was simply that, one, that having the personnel and teams assembled for assassination having the wherewithal to do it, having the intelligence connections to cover it up, that they simply turned their guns on Kennedy, and that's where it all came from, out of that whole collaboration between the mob and the CIA and some of the Cuban exiles. One of the more startling bits of evidence that Oswald was either a member of Project Freedom, part of the program, or that he had been manipulated in such a way that Bobby Kennedy was certain that he was, uh, is found in an article written by a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who was in Washington DC with one of the leaders of Project Freedom just hours after the assassination. And he received a telephone call from Bobby Kennedy just a few hours after Jack was killed. And Bobby's comment to him was, one of, one of your guys did it. One of your guys just killed my brother. And uh, this clearly demonstrates that Bobby's first response was that he recognized either Oswald's name or Oswald's position and that he believed that Project Freedom had been breached. And this also shows us how and why the Cuba contingency plans were immediately invoked, why the government would go to the lengths that it went to to violate state and federal law to seize John Kennedy's body from Dallas, take it to a federal facility in Bethesda. Immediately after the autopsy, the body was then delivered into the care of, of then Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Haig, later Secretary of State Alexander Haig, and Haig, of course, was one of the authors of one of the Cuba contingency plans. It's very clear from all the conversations we've had with the people who were close to Bobby at that time that he believed, at least in those early days, possibly weeks, that his program that he was responsible for, that he was running, had somehow been turned around or compromised and used to murder his brother, that he bore some personal level of responsibility for the death of his brother.